Let's talk about you. <laughs> you just got back from Mexico. Uh, yeah, literally yesterday I got back uh, from Mexico. Uh, well, I, the last two and a half months, I did a two-week tour of Europe. I did a three-week tour of Japan. I got home for three days. Then I went and did uh, a tour of South America. Uh, went directly to Los Angeles, New York, and then I just did a five-day tour of Mexico, including uh, wrestling in front of 6,000 people in uh, Arena Monterrey uh, with some of the biggest legends in the Mexico history. And then the next night, I wrestled on a baseball stadium in, uh, in a, with a sand locker room in front of about 40 people. Wow. So, well, like, which literally sums up my career. Well, take, well <laughs> take me through, because I think a lot of people, I would assume a lot of people in this audience don't know that much about pro wrestling, but what they do know is they know some of the big names, and they know the WWE. But take us through, what is the indie wrestling world? Yeah, it's, it, it's hard because, so, like, I'm an independent professional wrestler, and uh, I, I love comedy. I love comedy. There's, there's, it's probably one, one of my biggest passions next to professional wrestling. And I love, you know, uh, obviously the alternative side of the, an, an, alt, com an alt comic, alt com comedy. Sure. Uh, so I try to twist my world of wrestling and comedy together. And I try to use this term, an alt wrestler. But it just doesn't. <laughs> it's not the right the thing. The alt people are like, what? Yeah. And the wrestling people are like, what? Like, I'm an alternative wrestler. They're like, oh. <laughs> so that's, uh, but that's my idea is I am just like, an, I am an artist. I am a musician. I am a poet. I am, a, you know, I'm all these things. But my version of that is professional wrestling. And I've, I've done it, like I said, I've, I've, I did it for so long. I did about eight years until I got signed by the WWE, and I do it in VFW halls and armories. I do it all over the world in front of sometimes 50 people. I've wrestled in front of six people. Uh, I've wrestled, you know, in front of 100. At some point, you get Have to... Have you ever wrestled alone? <laughs> <laughs> Just with my thoughts, <laughs> uh, And some of the indie wrestling are, are not... There's, so it gets to a point where there's a, where there's a cult. It's almost like a cult-like status. And there's 500, 600, 700, 1,000 people that come to these shows that have no advertising, only word of mouth, only the internet. And it gets to this cult underground status that eventually, you know, just like music, they pick, they pick up on it and they want to sign you. And, and I'm such a, obviously you saw from the clip, my style of wrestling and my idea of wrestling is so weird and bizarre and different. But, you know, these people all here, you know, in the WWE, Vince McMahon has no clue who I am, but the people that know him are that know him that know him are saying, "Hey, this Colt guy's making noise. This Colt guy's making a buzz. He's selling tickets. He's making money for other people. We should grab him." And then they pick, they pick me up and they sign me, and then I I deliver that on uh, you know on Monday Night Television, and then they're like, "Oh, we don't want this at all," <laughs> you know. <laughs> And so that's my claim as an independent professional wrestler. I do it all over the world. I'm my own manager. I'm my own agent. I'm my own booker. I'm proud uh, to live in the city of Chicago and be a Chicago and represent this city. Yeah. But you are. I mean, you are the ultimate like Chicago hustling guy. I mean, you're and and you. So you grew up. You grew up in. I mean, this is probably an a unique way for a, a wrestler to grow up. You grew up a Jewish person in Deerfield, which I'd assume. <laughs> I'd assume that you're the only one who grew up a Jewish in Deerfield who's now pro wrestling. Did you know from the Purell? <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me about, let's go back. Let's talk about well, growing up. Were you the kid who was just, I mean, I, I had friends. I mean, I grew up in the 80s when wrestling was huge, and I would have some kids who would just say, hey, you want to go out? No, no, watching wrestling. Well, come on, there's a movie. No, 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 wrestling. Were you that kid? And the movie, if I was to watch it, would be Suburban Commando with Hulk Hogan. <laughs> obsessed. Just obsessed with wrestling. And one of my only regrets, same, the, the Jewish thing brought up a story, was um, you get to a point where you're obsessed with wrestling, and then all of a sudden girls and music, or, or sometimes even at, at 13 or 14, you know, alcohol or whatever gets into people's, you know, that's not for you guys. Just <laughs> uh, <laughs> Why do we have children in the front row? <laughs> But that gets into people's world. And for like a little bit, I was like, okay, I guess I shouldn't like wrestling anymore. And that was about 13 when I had my bar mitzvah. And one of my biggest regrets is not having my theme being pro wrestling. It was Great America. And, uh, and you know, I had roller coasters, but like you in the back of my mind. You could have taken down the rabbi. In the back of my mind, I wanted junkyard so dogs. So what if I don't know the half Torah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and so that's, but that I was a Jewish kid um, in Deerfield. No ever 
Jews have ever become from that area have not not only haven't they become wrestlers, but no one even liked wrestling over mm-hmm. the, you know or once they got past that point. Well, you kind of grew up probably at an awkward time for pro wrestling, and that it probably wasn't as big when you were a kid as it was when I was a kid, or when it was like five years later. Well, yeah, there was a gap. There was a gap where it went from Hulkamania. Then there was a gap of like where Vince McMahon wanted all like there was like a, a clown a. Uh, dumpster, uh, Duke the Dumpster Drossy. That, he that these, was your time. Yes, <laughs> that would have been my time. <laughs> and then it got really big in, in the late 90s. But, I mean, I was a Hulkamaniac, and I, it's, I wasn't at the wrong time because I loved it when I was... I remember watching it when I was three years old. My dad had television. Uh, he had, my dad had the television on, and I remember Andre the Giant getting his hair cut. Uh, and I, I don't know... I don't know. It just stuck with me. Mm. I, for some reason, that image, that vision... Two guys cutting his hair in the middle of the ring. I don't know what it was. Um, I, I, I was never like a, a theater kid or anything. Uh, I was always a sports guy. I actually went and played uh, Division One football uh, because I thought that was a, the closest way to get me to wrestling. Uh, but for some reason, like that was the ultimate sport for me was professional wrestling. So then you get out, you go to college, but you were also getting into training. And you talk about this all the time on your podcast, and all the wrestlers are talking about their training. What is training consist of, and where did you do it? Yeah, I trained in the city uh, on uh, Foster on Foster Avenue. Um, and I played one year of football, and I couldn't take it anymore. I, I just had... I, I was an adult. I was eight. My parents said, once you graduate college, you can do whatever you want. And I said, okay, that, fine, I'll play football. And I was 18, and I did one year, and I hated it. And I was like, you know what? I'm 18. I'm a grown-up now, Mom. I'm going to go do wrestling. But can you still pay for my college, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm still a grown-up, though. And, uh, <laughs> and I did. And so if I continued uh, doing college, I could, and I paid for wrestling with my, with my, mar, with my bar mitzvah money. And uh, true story. And training was, I remember I just came off of two-a-days on a Division I Western Michigan, uh, so, so the cardio wasn't that rough for me. But, uh, and the physicalness, uh, what, I, I knew exactly what I wanted to get into and why I was doing it. So I, I trained about three days a week for probably about three years, um, and I would drive back and forth from Kalamazoo to Chicago, and uh, just, wow. yeah, constantly just getting, you know, very physical, getting yourself stretched. They, they want to make sure that if you're going to be a professional wrestler, that you can handle it. You can handle anything. I think that's like any job. But this one happens to be in spandex with baby oil and it's <laughs> a little more physical. But yeah, and, 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 and not like, it, like I just went over and did a tour of Japan and they have these guys that they, they have what they call young boys, trainees, and they won't let them get in the ring until about two years and they literally beat the crap out of these guys, make their lives miserable because they say, you know, if you're going to be the next person in line to carry on the tradition of professional wrestling in that country, then you have to be me- ready mentally, physically, everything. So I, when I watched the, what they did to these Japanese guys, a thousand squats a day, a thousand push-ups a day, everything, you know, you name it, literally slapping them around, beating the crap out of them, I, I almost had it easy, and I know I had it rough. So then you, you do the training, and then you, you don't go straight to the WWE, though. You, you get back, you, you start out on the indie circuit. Yeah. Is that a typical way for a pro wrestler to begin his career, to yeah. do indie for a while? Yeah, you can, it's, it's a parallel to stand-up, it's a parallel to music, it's a parallel to all these things. You just have to, I can swear, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah You absolutely. just have to eat shit. Like, Not you, shit, though. Oh, shit. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta eat poop. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I did, I did shows. I, drove, I used to drive from Kalamazoo to Minnesota once a month, St. Paul. That's a 10-hour trip there, 10-hour trip back for 20 bucks. You spend that 20 bucks at Perkins the morning after the show. I mean, you know, you're losing money. You're doing these trips. And not only that, once a month, I'm going... I'm going to, to Louisville, I'm going to Pittsburgh, I'm going to Ohio, because I don't want to, I want to get my name out there. I want to be known. I want to be that guy. And I understand, and the internet wasn't really that prevalent at the time, so there was a couple things in the magazines and whatever, but whenever those magazines were around, I wanted them to make sure that Colt Cabana's name was there, and they were reading it, and that name spreads. Where did the character, where, you're not, your real name is not Colt Cabana. Yeah. Where did that name come from? Where did the character come from? Well, my last name's Colton, okay. so I wanted Colt to be part of my name. Uh, I think just it just Col- from Copacabana. Okay. Yeah, it just clicked. It actually Barry. Some I have such a uh, an awesome group of fans that someone did some radio station and got Barry Manilow to do a liner for my podcast. So he's like, <laughs> "Hey, this is Barry Manilow. You're listening to the Auto Wrestling," and he turned British somehow. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but I have developed this this total. I, I almost consider myself a comedian first and a wrestler second. 
uh, nowadays, and I, I consider my, my stage to be the wrestling ring. And that's taken a long time. You know, first five, six years, I was just the wrestler's wrestler. And, uh, you know, it, it just got to a point where I knew what I wanted to do. I, I, I you know, you, you have to... You have to discover yourself, and those six years of just being a regular wrestler, I was able to discover what I liked and what I didn't like, and naturally, I'm a charismatic, fun-loving, outgoing person. I told you I love comedy, so I just want to interact them all together, and if you're going to be success successful in anything, especially the arts and the entertainment, you have to be you, and you have to, you know, you have to be confident in what you're doing, and so when I'm me, I'm very, con you know, in the wrestling ring, I'm confident because I know who I am and what I want as a performer. Well, let me ask you that, because wrestlers are playing an outsized character for the most part. How much, I guess in your case, but how much in the other wrestlers you've seen, is there a parallel between the character we see in the ring or on TV and the actual person? And is there ever like a real jerk, is that okay, jerk? A real <laughs> jerk. Well, she's real bad. <laughs> jerk a real jerk character who all of a sudden, who wasn't a jerk, who starts becoming that person in real life. Where is the separation between the wrestler and the person? It's important that it, it's the successful ones will have, will imitate themselves. And you hear, remember Stone Cold, I mean, you, Hulk Hogan, you've seen him on that show with uh, Brooke and you know yeah. his family. He's obnoxious, but that's, <laughs> that's who he is. You know? You're an extension of yourself. So it's important that you are. And there's, there hasn't been many that weren't you know, in tune with themselves that have become successful. Uh, I don't. I don't know if there's people that have. I mean, yes. Uh, listen, we get into this world of wrestling, and luckily, I I, I consider myself grounded. Uh, I have a, you know a great family who's kind of kept me in check, and I've never. I don't have some kind of ego or anything. I, I like to think about myself, but there's guys who get who get carried away, especially with the lifestyle, and uh, you know when these guys in WWE when they're making, you know, it's one thing to make. You know, to be happy to make thirty thousand a year, and it's another thing to be making you know a million dollars like like it's nothing. And then all of a sudden, people are coming. I mean, it's just saying it's the rock and roll lifestyle, and that it can it can screw with people. On the other hand, from what I understand from listening to your podcast, and you can speak to it from that perspective, but also from being there for a little bit, the WWE is not totally fun for the wrestlers. Yeah, and you'll hear the stories that 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 these guys are telling on my podcast, and and the stories that. Um, it's it's taxing. It's it's become corporate America. It's not the circus. You know, it started out as the circus and the sideshow, and now it's really become a corporate America uh, thing. And these guys, it, it's all, there's very few people who who come out of the experience of WWE and say they enjoy it. Now, guys in it right now, of course, they're gonna say the corporate line. They love it. They're you know they're one smile at a time or whatever. But a lot of these guys, it's stressful. It's taxing. It, it's you know five days a week on the road. Um, but if you want to be, it's almost like, and, and I'm like a great example of trying to change that, but if you want to be successful as a professional wrestler, you know, if I go to anybody and I say, hey, I'm a professional wrestler, then they go, oh, are you, were you in the WWE? And I say, no, they're like, Pfft. you know, but if I say yes, and even if I say, yeah, I was there for a bit, they're like, oh, okay, he's legit. But what they don't know is a, a shitty cup of coffee, you know, with no cream. Would you, if, if tomorrow Vince McMahon said, hey, we've heard the podcast, we've seen what you're doing lately, we want you back. Would you take it? That's all of me says. No, I'm doing great right now. I've got my podcast. I got a movie. I'm traveling the world. Blah blah blah. But the wrestler in me, the guy who watched it as a kid, and I don't, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me. But I, I would. I'd say yes. You know, I, I for some reason that's it was your dream. That's the dream, and and especially the character that I played there. You know, I want to write that wrong so bad because I know that's not my career in WWE wasn't what it was supposed to be. What I had worked so hard. What I continue to work hard for is that, you know, I, I want to write that wrong. I want to show people, I, I did a character called Scotty Goldman, you know, and I want to say, you know, Scotty Goldman wasn't what I was capable of, what, what people should remember me as. They should remember Colt Cabana or whatever you want to call me, Mookie, Kirby, well, you know, you name it, I'll play it. But I, I know I could play it a lot better. Just not Scotty Goldman. Just not, yeah. <laughs> now, oddly enough, you've had a presence in the WWE because of your friend, CM Punk. So... CM Punk, for those of you not in the know like me, uh, is not right now, I guess, but he's been a champion in WWE, one of the biggest stars in wrestling. In fact, my we have an action figure of him at home. Nice. Um, and he was, uh, he was your roommate for a while. You grew up, I mean, you grew up in the training part of your life with him. And then he's this big star, and then I think it was earlier this year, or was it earlier this year? Uh, yeah, it was this summer, the summer of punk. That he... 
goes on a rant during one of, or d during a promo for an upcoming match against the against the champion, and just basically tears the WWE to shreds. And he mentioned, and then he turns to the to the camera and he says, "Hello, Colt Cabana." And after that, people started saying, "Who's this Colt Cabana?" Going to the podcast, tell me about your relationship with CM Punk, and we don't have to get into how much of that was scripted or not, but. How much of that was scripted? <laughs> uh, I mean, that was a huge deal for him, you know, and that was, it sold out the Allstate Arena, you know, 18,000 people in Chicago, and he's a Chicago boy, and we trained together at the Steel Domain on, on Foster and Irving, and, um, in front, and, and when you think about it, you know, let's say I have, you know, 20,000, 30,000 at the time followers on Twitter, he went on, on the, uh, the USA channel, and in front of four or five million people said, hey, Cole Cabana, when he wasn't supposed to, so all of a sudden, uh, I mean, right, my, my business for myself or whatever, you know, that's a friend saying, here's a hand. And, and now all of a sudden, right, the podcast spikes, my T-shirts spike, everything's going well. Uh, you know, now I'm doing, you know, a little bit better thanks to him. And that's me and him looking out for each other. And when I told you about those trips that we would do, Pittsburgh, Ohio, whatever, that was me and Punk for 20 10, 30, we were doing those trips together. You know, his path got a little more successful than mine. And I, and, I, and he's still sleeping on your couch. Yeah, and that's a story I was telling is that, you know, I, at the time I owned, I, I had my place in Wicker Park and uh, he was, I had just been fired by WWE and he was sleeping there and he was then sleeping on my couch and he was the world champion. And I would wake up and he's sleeping on my couch, my shitty futon, by the way. And the world championship is just sitting on the floor. <laughs> And I don't know where my next paycheck's coming. <laughs> and he's, you know, scratching his balls with a $100 bill. And so <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, he's amazing. He, you know, it's, the, it's back and forth, our friendship. He takes, you know, he takes care of me. I, when I can, I take care of him. And so that's something he did for me. You know, he, he said my name on television. Uh, you know, luck, boom, I was trending worldwide. And then, you know, two weeks later, he said my name again. I was trending worldwide again. And I think that it's just it's that's more friendship, more realizing that he can kind of get away with that now that he's one of the big wigs up there, and in the world of professional wrestling, he's one of the top dogs. And if he can throw me a couple bones now and then, you know, he does. But it's also, and I think you've spoken to this, kind of a genius move on the WWE's part to let that happen and to let reality creep into wrestling more than it had. Yeah, but then why? Then the obvious answer is, oh well, then let's. Wow, let's sign Colt and put him, you know, let him be Punk's lackey or whatever. But they don't. That's true. So, they is will. it is it that genius by them, or is it, you know? <laughs> so real quick, where can people? Uh, you're you're wrestling tomorrow in LaSalle. I'm wrestling in LaSalle uh, the night after Thanksgiving. I'm actually wrestling. Billy Corrigan is starting a, a wrestling. Yeah, he's starting a wrestling promotion at Excalibur downtown. Yeah. So I'm wrestling downtown for Billy Corrigan. <laughs> Like that's I got. I, is he got, gonna get in the ring? I I have no clue. But I, I want you to realize how weird my life is. Like I wrestle for the Insane Clown Posse. They're my bosses. <laughs> like that's. It's just, I hear they're really nice guys. They're the best. They're yeah. like my heroes. And that's again. That's like their own psychopathic records is their own thing. They have no bosses. They work for themselves. Totally do it yourself. And whatever you say about them, you have to appreciate like what they're doing business wise. And violent, violent J has sat me down. That's funny to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> violent J has sat me down and he's taught me some things. And like, you know, that's, that's what I want to learn. Um, but yeah, sorry. I, I'm wrestling. Uh, my, my podcast is on iTunes. It's called the art of wrestling. It's available at welovecolt.com. I have a merchandise store. It's called coltmerch.com. I have a web series every Monday with Chicago stand-up comedian Marty DeRosa, who's great. It's called Creative Has Nothing For You. Uh, I have a movie, a documentary that, that describes everything that I'm talking about, my travels, my roads, my, my, my tribulations. That's called The Wrestling Road Diaries, and we just actually signed a deal with, with uh, Jamie Kennedy's production company. Again, this is so weird. Like, I didn't mean to drop that name, but like... What? Jamie Kennedy? I don't know. It's, just, it's a bizarre world that I'm living in. And um, I have so much going on. And that's, again, I, like that story in The Reader is just like, I'm hustling, I'm grinding, I'm doing everything I can. I have nobody working for me. My, my parents were like, why don't you get like an intern from Northwestern or, or whatever? <laughs> and it was just like, first of all, they would totally outshine me, you know, in business strategy. But like, I got I, gotta, I don't know. You're yeah. a hustler. I yeah. mean, I got to do it myself. I, I just want to be my own person, my own brand. I'm trying to make the Colt Cabana name. Uh, as much as I can by myself. What's great about it not being your name is that you can talk about yourself in the third person without right. being obnoxious. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
Because if you're like Scotty Colton, no, no, no. But you can say Colt Cabana because it's not it's your a, Right, it's a brand. It's a figment. It's yeah. Colt Cabana. Yeah. Right on. Colt Thank Cabana, you. everyone. <laughs> Thank you.